Recording. Is this thing live? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, hello, Advanced Kentucky and other Kentucky AP Chem students and teachers, and a special welcome to students. Um, this is our first course content review session in chemistry. We've had a biology session and several math sessions. Um, I'm your presenter, Lou Akampora. Many of you may know me as the science content director and AP Chem um, teacher, Bobby Vaughn, et cetera. Um, Tina Rose and Aaron Timmons and Monique Rice are also um, the content directors of those respective areas. And, and you'll see from them. And I hope um, you know, participate in some of those sessions. A little bit of etiquette, please. Turn off your microphones, mute your microphones, turn off your video. We'll be using the chat room and I'm hoping to get some polling out there to see what you guys know and what you, uh, what might give you some trouble. So uh, again, Lou Akampora, Science Director for Advanced Kentucky. The topic of today's dissertation discussion is the structure of matter. And this is certainly central to AP chemistry or any chemistry. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides. It's a not very periodic table, but it's a table of substances that might be three to 400 years old. And I love the alchemical symbols. It doesn't really tell you much. There is an order to it. It tells you if you know how to read it, what reacts with what and so forth. But it's not gonna be too useful today. I just like it and I want to share it with you. What is the structure of matter? Well, I mean, you're gonna see questions on the AP Chem exam, or a question dealing with what matter is and why it, why it is that way. So answering any of those questions will really get down to what are the particles and what are the forces? And this is quite a nuanced question. We'll spend much of the hour talking about it. Uh, in, in some sense, it's very simple. What are the particles in chemistry? Well, they're electrons and nuclei. And I know some of you want to say protons, neutrons, and electrons, but for us, it's really going to be electrons and nuclei. And I'll talk about why that's true in, in just a minute. And what are the forces? Well, the forces are easy. The forces, only one of them for chemistry, and that is Coulomb's law. Um, and this is this is a little bit of physics, but it's, it's not too hard. Um, Coulomb's law, something that was known well before chemists even knew that atoms existed, tells us that when you have charged particles, here represented by Q2, Q1 and Q2, there is an, a force and therefore an energy of interaction. And the expression for that energy, and I don't know why it's got the symbol U, um, but the electrostatic energy is some constant K times the product of the charges divided by R, where R is a distance between them. And this is the only force that chemistry, that, that particles in chemistry feel. If we take a look inside the nucleus, that's a, then there'd be other forces, but that's not, that's not for us. Um, so in a sense, everything that we call van der Waals forces or dispersion forces or covalent bonds or ionization forces, these really are some manifestation of Coulomb's law. And understanding this is really central to any question that the AP chemistry exam or course might throw at you. Um, so in, in one sense, it's very simple. In another sense, it's very complicated. Um, but just remember, charges either attract or repel each other. Most of you, I think, know that like charges would, would repel each other, whoops, and unlike charges would attract each other. So two electrons would want to be as far apart from each other as possible, speaking quite anthropomorphically. Um, electrons want to be close to nuclei, which are positively charged. And the, the more protons, the stronger that nucleus is, the more highly charged it is, the stronger it will attract electrons. Um, layering on top of that is the, the structure of the atom. And a lot of chemistry went into figuring out what the atom is and what its structure is. I'm not going to go into detail here, um, but you should know a little bit about what the nucleus is at the number of protons as the atomic number, and that determines the chemical identity of the atom by pulling in the electrons with a certain amount of charge, a certain force. 
There are also neutrons in the nucleus, and they really hold the protons together and affect the mass, but don't affect the chemical properties. And that's why different isotopes have the same chemical properties. Of course, you can't have all positive charges, so we also have our, our friends, the electrons. And the key to knowing electrons is that um, they can only exist in certain orbit holes. A hundred years ago, we might have said orbits, and you might have seen, seen uh, think about an electron as a planet orbiting around a nucleus, but a much more sophisticated, harder, but accurate description is to, to say that these electrons occupy orbitals which have a size, a shape, an orientation, and an energy level. And as chemists, we designate them by the old spectroscopist designation, 1s, 2p, 3p, et cetera. You need to understand what orbitals exist and how they generate the electron configuration. And it's this electron configuration of an atom that really gen develops or explains a periodic table. So um, this iconic diagram tells us that um, the properties of elements are periodic because of the shells. As you fill up a shell, the, the properties tend to change. And by properties, we mean ionization energy, bond strength, what would have been called valency. And as you complete a shell, and then we get to the right-hand side of the periodic table, most of you remember that those are the noble gases, the ones that don't really react so much. Then a new electron starts a new shell, and we start the, start the, plant, start the trend all over again. Make sure that you don't memorize these trends. Chemistry is not going to be that mean to you. But make sure you can explain them, that as you go across left to right across the periodic table, the nuclear charge increases. We add a proton to the nucleus. The distance from the nucleus doesn't change much. In fact, it gets smaller because those electrons are added to the same principal quantum number or shell. And therefore, the effective nuclear charge increases, the ionization energy increases. As you go down from top to bottom on the periodic table, we're adding more and more shells. So even though the nucleus is more highly charged, those inner electrons are screening off the, the outermost, or because they're very special in chemistry, we call them the valence electrons. Um, from that nuclear charge, and the ionization energies tend to decrease. The atoms get larger, and um, the bonds actually are typically get weaker. Explain terms, explain these in terms of the trends, not memorizing facts, not a geography lesson, but also think what happens when added electrons are added or taken away, when an atom becomes a negative ion by gaining electrons, or, or a positive ion by losing electrons. And these are the principles to use. And because of the, within an atom, the distance between particles is the smallest compared to between different atoms in a molecule or between different molecules, these atomic forces, intra-atomic forces tend to be stronger and the energies tend to be greater. So I'm gonna give you a warm up here and, um, ask you to consider this table of four elements, oxygen, fluorine, neon, and sodium. And you're given the ionization energies and the atomic radii. And um, I have to say, which of these following statements would best explain why the first ionization energy of neon is greater than that for fluorine? And as you can see, it's certainly on the data shows that. And we'll just open the polling. Anthony, can you do that? Give me a, and Lou, let me switch uh, you to host. Okay, then I can't do the PowerPoint, but okay. Because um, I, I don't have the I don't have the polling option. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to have to stop sharing my screen and go to polls and add a question. Okay, this might be too clunky. A, B, C, or D. Uh, anonymous, under a title, number one. And save. 
Uh, Sarah, this is too clunky. Lou, if you want me to take over as host, I'll do it. Okay, Anthony, can you sh send it back to Monique? I'm lost here. Well, now that you're host, you have to send it oh, back okay. to me. I'm doing that. Okay, sorry out there, we're, we're working out these technical difficulties. I'm gonna go back to my screen and hopefully Monique will be able to put up a poll. Uh, there we go. Okay, there's your screen, but it doesn't look like I can do the poll. Um, why don't we just share answers, A, B, C, or D? Okay, so right, if you, you participants out there, if you could go ahead and chat right in now, which of these um, options seems most attractive? Um, and I'm not seeing, oh, I could see the chat room maybe. Okay, I can't see the chat room without unsharing my screen. And rather than go back and forth, um, Anthony, can you give me a consensus? What are the, uh, has anyone chatted in? Okay, well. Um, Actually, everybody is very, very quiet. Uh, that's understandable. Uh, well, I. I the, all of these are true statements. Neon atoms, in fact, do have eight valence electrons. Fluorine atoms do have seven. That, that doesn't really explain the difference in ionization energies. Remember, the ionization energy is the energy you need to remove an electron. And the fact that neons is greater than that of fluorine um, is because neon has 10 protons, but fluorine atoms only have nine protons. And you'd, you, I expect most of you would need to look at a periodic table to know that. Uh, you should have a periodic table with you. I perhaps should have mentioned that. Um, all of these other statements are true, but none of them really explain that. And this is, this is typical of what the AP chemistry exam and course looks like. They're not going to ask you to memorize ionization energies, but rather to give you data and ask you to explain that. Um, so we'll go ahead and and for those of you who are interested in those teachers out there, um, these power these questions will be available from the website KY 2020 APKY 2020 um, as a PDF file. All right, so moving on. Um, same property, same table of four elements with their properties. And now you're asked which of the following equations represent the first ionization of a neutral gas phase fluorine atom. And you're given four choices. I'm going to guess that no one's going to be suddenly interested in chatting. Um, so I'll just give you a second to read over that cho those choices. And then we'll see what that involves. Is everyone out there thinking? Okay, so all of these all of these equations correspond to different energy, different processes. The letter A tells us that I've got F2, a fluorine molecule, and we are splitting that apart into two isolated fluorine atoms. Um, that's definitely not have does not have anything to do with ionization. There is a good name for that though, and that would be called the bond energy, or I like to use the term bond dissociation energy for fluorine. It, it would tell you the amount of energy needed to break the, the covalent bond between two fluorine atoms. And we could also predict that it would be much, much less than the ionization energy of fluorine because we're looking at, at forces between, between particles, not forces within an atom. Um, choice B, well, again, we're not, we're adding electrons to a fluorine molecule and, and that fluorine molecule is splitting into two fluoride ions. This would be the, the 
um, standard reduction potential of fluorine. Um, again, it's an important quantity in chemistry, but, but not, not the ionization energy. Letter C, it comes close. In this case, a neutral isolated fluorine atom is gaining an electron to become a fluoride ion. There is a name for that. It is the electron affinity for fluorine, but it's not the ionization energy. Our, our choice here is letter D, the correct choice, which tells us um, that a neutral fluorine atom is losing one electron to become a fluoride, not a fluoride ion, but a fluorine ion with a charge of plus one. And that requires about 1,681 kilojoules per mole, a rather high number, but not as high as neon. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit here because I do want to get through many things. So we're going to look at at this, and one of the one of the recent addition to the um, advanced placement chemistry curriculum has been the interpretation of photoelectron spectra. There's one of these on almost every exam. I don't know if one will show up this year with a shortened exam, but it is important because it, um, it really is experimental evidence for what we've been claiming that these electrons can't just be anywhere with any energy, but have certain allowable energy levels. So a, a photoelectron spectrum is gonna tell us the binding electron per, binding energy per electron and that's in could be in units of millijoule, megajoules per mole or electron volts or per atom are common. Notice this is a logarithmic scale. It goes 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100, and 1,000. This would be very difficult to show on a linear scale. These first four peaks would be all scrunched together and peak A would be way, way out in left field. Um, and the height of each peak corresponds to the number of electrons. And so what would this mean? Well, these are actually fairly simple to read. The electrons with the lowest or the most negative energy with the greatest binding energy are going to be the electrons closest to the nucleus. And those would be the, the electrons designated 1s, 1s. So this first peak here, peak labeled A, would correspond to the 1s electrons. After that, we've got the 2s electrons and then the 2p electrons going in order of increasing energy. Notice because there are six electrons in a filled 2p subshell, but only two electrons in a filled 2s or 1s subshell, that the peak for this peak, the height of this peak is three times greater. Um, and then we've got 3s and then 3p. The fact that there are only two electrons in that 3p subshell, as evidenced by the height, um, tells us it's not filled. Um, to look at this question, and maybe you've all had a chance to read this question. Um, the answer is very certainly C, that photoelectron spectra indicate, are, are good evidence that, that atomic orbitals with definite energy levels exist. Um, anyone who is familiar with the periodic table might have guessed that. That's the only way to explain the periodic table. But, but this is why are we, where we, why, um, photoelectron spectra are important. I think we've already answered this question in my little dissertation. Um, again, counting from the highest binding energy, which are the most tightly held electrons, the ones with the lowest absolute energy, we have the 1s, the 2s, the 2p, the 3s, and then the, 3, the 3p, or 3s and the 3p electrons. So the 2s electrons would correspond to the peak labeled D. B, I say B as in boy. And then again, in order to figure out to tell which element generates a spectrum, we just need to count the electrons. And we've got two plus two plus six, that's 10, plus two plus two is 14. So this would be the photoelectron spectrum of a silicon atom. Um, We'll look at one more, one more question here and then move on. So uh, here's a question where you're given unknown elements from the third period, the period that starts with sodium and ends with argon, and you're given successive ionization energies and asked to, to decide which of those elements is most metallic in character. So what does metal mean? And I hope most of you know that the metals are, are those elements on the left side of the periodic table, the ones that 
that lose their electrons easily in chemical reactions, but even as pure metals, they share their electrons um, in what's called the electron C model. Um, this explains the conductivity of solid metals. And the most metallic would be the one, therefore, with the lowest ionization energy, and that would be um, element two. So we would, we would expect to say that element two is the most metallic in character. Um, the smallest radius, well, the smallest radius, this is a little bit tricky because how does this relate to Coulomb's law? And remember, small radii mean that the electrons are going to be pulled in the tightest, which means that they will have the highest ionization energy. So of these elements, we would look for the um, element with the greatest value of the first ionization energy, and that would be element one. And again, this, the, the answer key here tells us that the trend is uh, ionization energy increase and atomic radius decrease. And that's, that's a fact, but it's not an explanation. And the, 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 explanation, the explanation says that because we're increasing the nuclear charge as we proceed across the periodic table, this really should say, without changing the, the valence shell, but since the question stated that all of these elements were in the third period, I don't think it would be necessary to include that. And then finally, you're asked to say, how many valence electrons would be present in neutral atoms of element three? And it might be hard. You, I thought to myself the first time I saw that is, how should I know that? All I have are ionization energies. But we need to remember what successive ionization energies mean that you're going to pull electrons from successively from a neutral atom. Element three tells us, well, the first, electro, first ionization energy takes 738 kilojoules per mole. And you don't need to know what that value means exactly, but it's in the ballpark of these others. The second ionization energy requires about twice as much energy, and that is consistent because now we're removing an, a negatively charged electron from a particle that already has a positive charge. Jumping to the third ionization energy takes over five times the energy from the second. So there's a big jump between the second and third. And this tells us not only are we re removing an electron from a, um, part, a particle that's got a charge of plus two, but we're taking it from an inner shell. And this would tell us that there are two, two valence electrons in element three. In the interest of moving on, I'm not going to go over the answers to these. They will be posted on, on our website. But um, you should understand what these questions mean, and they should be familiar to you um, for some element, in this case, selenium. So know what an isotope is, know what they have in common, and that would be the number of protons or the chemical properties. You should all be able to write the complete electron configuration. And I know many, many times you can get away with a shorthand. If the question asks for complete electron configuration, make sure you include all the electrons. And then explaining the ionization energies compared to the neighbors. Another similar question from an, another AP Chem exam, um, where they don't actually use the words, but um, they're asked for complete chemical electron configurations for a neutral sulfur atom and a sulfide ion. And remember, when you've got an ion, you've just to get account for the different numbers of electrons. When you have a transition metal ion, make sure you understand that the, the valence shell electrons are lost first. It seems counterintuitive because they're, they go in before the D level electrons, but they do get lost first. Um, and then you know, so you should be able to do that. You should explain why the radius of the sulfide, sulfide ion is larger than the sulfur atom. And then talk about unpaired electrons. So some of this may be unfamiliar to you. I want to talk a little bit about part B here, which says a sulfide ion is isoelectronic with the argon atom. Which species requires, which of those species requires less energy to remove an electron and explain an isoelectronic tells us that they've got the same number of electrons. Um, 
he didn't have to be told that. Um, many students who tried to answer this question focused on the fact that sulfide was a, had a net charge and argon didn't, but that was a little bit of a, of a red herring, a distractor. The real, you know, a better answer is to say, well, I've got the same number of electrons. What is different in these species? And that's the number of protons because the argon atom has 18 protons in the nucleus, but the sulfide ion has only 16. The greater number of protons, did I say neutrons? Protons would cause a greater attraction for those electrons. And therefore, argon would have a greater ionization energy or require more energy. So the sulfide ion would require less energy. Okay, I'm gonna move on a little bit. Um, as we get bigger than an atom, what's bigger than an atom? Well, a molecule. Um, and you need to talk a little bit about covalent bonding or chemical bonding, and that they're covalent or ionic bonds. And again, without going into too much detail, um, the skills you need to know, and there's lots of practice, um, are to first of all, be able to draw electron dot diagrams for covalent bonds, to be able to interpret those electron dot diagrams in terms of a shape um, that using Vesper or valence shell electron pair repulsion you know, model. And given the shape to be able to state whether or not a molecule is polar, because that's important when we talk about the intermolecular forces. Um, the intermolecular forces, the forces between molecules. And these are the different types. And we'll talk about those more um, in a little bit, but these are the, the important skills you should have. Um, this really focuses on covalently bound particles, molecules, and polyatomic ions. Um, particles that are ionic, and the classic example for that would be sodium chloride, the stuff you probably sprinkle on your french fries, but we would never talk about a molecule of sodium chloride, we talk about ions, and we'll look at that again in a little bit. So. Um, as we look at that, one classic graph that you should be familiar with is what's called a Leonard Morse graph. And it shows for, in this case, three different molecules, how the energy, the potential energy on the vertical axis varies with internuclear separation. Notice all three of these graphs, when I get to large distances, these particles are far apart. There's no energy of interaction. And you might, a naive interpretation of Coulomb's law might say, well, Mr. A, I mean, these are neutral particles. Why should they interact? Why should there be any energy as they come close? Because when we look at Coulomb's law, if the charge is zero, well, the, the force and the energy have got to be zero. But Coulomb's law works terrific if you've got point particles when you have um, atoms that have nuclei and electrons, those electrons will rearrange themselves, will reconfigure themselves so that the electrons of one atom will be attracted to the nucleus of the other and vice versa, and that will result in a net attractive force. So for any atom, as the atom, or for any pair of atoms, as they come closer together, the energy will decrease will reach a minimum, and then as you try to force those nuclei together, the energy will shoot up. Um, <clears throat> what's the important point on this graph? Well, it's, you can probably guess it's, a, it's the lowest point, the minimum for those calculus students, um, the point where the derivative is zero. Um, and this tells us the bond, the energy needed to break the bond, the bond dissociation energy, and the internuclear separation or the bond length. So, if we were to look at, at plot A here in red, and I said, what is the bond dissociation, what is the value of the bond dissociation, that bond dissociation energy of this molecule, you would have to look down here at the bottom of this curve and scale over here. And it looks to me like it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 kilojoules per mole. Even though this is negative, when we talk about the bond dissociation energy, Remember, that is the energy needed to split the bond. So we've got to go from down here up to here, and that's conventionally taken to be a positive number. This is often a mistake that AP chemistry students make because they've come from AP biology, where they've been taught that you know, ATP is a high energy molecule and energy is released when that bond breaks. This is emphatically not true. 
Um, you know, a lot more goes on there. And bond breaking is always requires energy or is endothermic. Um, if you're given a choice here and you're told these are hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, how might you know, how might you guess which is nitrogen? And here you've got to know that, that you know, electrons are shared and sometimes more than one pair will be shared in the case of nitrogen, the stuff that's that 80% of what we're breathing in and 80% of what we're breathing out, that's a very, very strong triple bond between those two atoms in the molecule. And because it's a triple bond, it is a very, very large bond dissociation energy. Its energy is way negative. So nitrogen with a triple bond would have a bond energy of about negative 900 kilojoules per mole. Hydrogen has got a single bond, and that's our 400 kilojoules per mole. And the bond between two oxygen atoms in one oxygen molecule is a double bond and has a bond energy of, of somewhere between you know, 6 and 650 kilojoules per mole. Um, so you know, understand that stronger bonds have greater bond association energy. That's going to skip over this one and jump right to intermolecular forces. And um, maybe we'll come back and look at an elect a, a, a problem that asks you to, to draw electron dot diagram. Um, but intermolecular forces, as the name implies, are the forces between molecules. And, and we use molecules here in a very, very hand wavy sense. Um, sometimes if we're talking about liquid argon, those molecules are just atoms or even iron metal. The particles, it, it should really be called interparticle forces, but years of tradition and textbooks call them intermolecular forces. Um, but these are the forces between molecules. Here I've got a representation on the screen, and I'm not sure if you can see this, but this is supposed to be um, methanol in a solid form, and you would guess that methanol, you would guess it's a solid because the particles are all lined up in a particular order, just so. And and when we heat up that methanol, and for the boiling point or the melting point of methanol is pretty low, it's about negative 80 degrees Celsius, um, that methanol melts. And those same particles spread out a little bit. Methanol expands, unlike uh, or can, on, on melting. But those particles maintain their identity as molecules. And we would write that as CH3OH, the chemical formula for methanol as a solid going to a liquid, and I might even put in some energy here, but the molecules maintain their integrity. And, and really what we're overcoming here is the fairly weak forces between the molecules. To break a methanol molecule apart would involve breaking covalent bond and would require significantly more energy, roughly 400 kilojoules per mole, as we saw for a single bond. Um, Many questions here are going to rely on building models. And again, this is another case where I, I seem to say the same things. And this slide, I don't know if you can see really well, it's on, a, again, on our, our note page. But rather than trying to memorize properties of different, different substances, which would be almost impossible, um, unless you have an eidetic memory, you really need to build models under, and understand what are the forces, what are the particles. When we have <clears throat> a ionic substance, and let me try to do this. There's a model of an ionic substance, possibly sodium chloride, where the, 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 the balls represent positive and negatively charged ions. This is held together by very, very strong, strong Coulombic forces. Um, the stronger, the more highly charged the ions, the stronger those forces are, and that's Coulomb's law. The smaller the ions are, the closer their nuclei will be, and the, and the stronger um, the forces. And that too is Coulomb's law. So if you're talking about ionic compounds, their properties, they're going to have very strong Coulombic forces between them. They'll typically have very high melting points. They will be very brittle. If you were to try to slide these particles past each other, you would be forcing positive charges next to other positive charges and negative charges close to other negative charges. And they would split apart. 
Um, these are very non-conductive. If you were to try to pass an electric current through a crystal of sodium chloride, it would not pass. Um, but if you were to dissolve sodium chloride into water, and we call that salt water, you would find that it, it dissolves readily, and that has to do with the polarity of water, but also that the resulting solution would be an electrolyte. So these are our, our charged, our ionic compounds. The other end of that continuum might be molecular compounds. And here we have a representation. We had methanol in the cover slide. This might be benzene, particles that are stacked together and are held together by weak intermolecular forces. Because these molecules are typically uncharged, or they're always uncharged if they're molecules, we call them ions if they're not, um, it's hard to see again where do these attractive forces come from. In this sense, <clears throat> they, are, they are there. If the molecule is nonpolar, and that's why we actually make a big deal out of being able to decide whether a molecule is polar or not. If the molecule is nonpolar, the charge is distributed evenly. Um, there are weak dispersion forces that exist between molecules. Um, calling them dispersion forces doesn't tell you why, where they come from, but um, you know, it does give them a name. What they come from is, again, because these electrons are not, um, there's a, a certain randomness to the arrangement of electrons around a nuclei or a set of nuclei. Um, even though we call a particle nonpolar, it will have, that's a very average, for a nonpolar on average. And there is a, there are always temporary instantaneous fluctuating dipoles that just vary all over 3D space. They average out to zero, but they're at any instant in time, even a nonpolar molecule will be slightly polar. And if it's next to another nonpolar molecule, that dipole, that, that, that weak, um, charge in, in equivalency, I guess, um, unbalance will, will um, induce a dipole in a neighboring molecule. And the cumulative effect of all of this is to have weak, well, they're not always that weak, uh, but to, to have attractive forces that are called dispersion forces. In fact, <clears throat> because these come about not just from the valence electrons, but from every electron in the particle, dispersion forces may in fact be the, the strongest forces between particles, even if, it, even if you happen to have a polar particle. But dispersion forces explains many observations um, that, for example, heavier particles, particles with more electrons tend to have higher melting points than nonpolar particles with fewer electrons. Those are the main to class of particles. Um, we also want to mention two others that are important. This is actually a model of silicon dioxide. Um, now you've all seen silicon dioxide. Certainly, well, I guess it's it's the main component of glass. And I'm not sure if you do see glass, you see through glass. It's also, you know sand in a very impure form. So anyone who's walked on a beach has actually stepped on lots of silicon dioxide. Notice that the blue spheres represent silicon atoms and the red spheres represent oxygen atoms. If we were to try to compare the properties of silicon dioxide which, with carbon dioxide, silicon is right below car beneath carbon on the periodic table, you might guess, well, it should be a gas, maybe a very low melting liquid. And the properties that we actually see for silicon dioxide are completely different than this. It's very high melting, very, very brittle, um, doesn't conduct. And you know, how do we explain this? Again, don't memorize this. Um, you'll be given the properties. But once you're told that the boiling point of silicon dioxide is in the thousands of, of degrees Celsius, you know that there can't be just dispersion forces holding these particles together. And in fact, if you look closely, these bars represent um, covalent bonds that extend throughout the entire grain of sand. So in, in one sense, we, what we call this a network covalent particle because the covalent bonds extend throughout the entire particle. And a grain of sand is really, in some sense, a single molecule of silicon dioxide with the empirical formula SiO2, but with perhaps 10 to the 22nd 
silicon atoms and twice that number of oxygen atoms in that, in that one grain of sand. And finally, put these back where they belong. Boy, that's about as boring a picture as you can imagine. It's kind of cannonballs, but this really is a good model of a metal and 80% of the elements on the periodic table are metallic. Um, and what you're seeing here are just the, that the electro, the, the atoms um, stack like cannonballs. But the key thing is that they, they share electrons. And because metal atoms have low ionization energies, the electrons are actually shared among all the atoms in a, in a um, bar of metal. Actually, there are micro domains, but we don't need to get into that. Because these electrons are mobile, Electron, uh, metals are pretty good conductors of electricity, even as solids. Um, they, they could be high melting, but be careful. Some metals are quite, have quite low melting points. Mercury that you can't play with anymore because it's been found to be dangerous is a liquid at room temperature. But even, even metals, things like gallium and the more reactive alkali metals, sodium and potassium, have very, very low melting points. Um, so I would say they have variable melting points. Um, they are very malleable. Unlike ionic compounds, you can push these atoms across each other and they're, they're, you're not going to be forcing opposite, <coughs> excuse me, opposite charges together. Um, they're, they're very good electrical and thermal conductors and they can dissolve in other metals or form mixtures with other metals that we call alloys. So those are the important properties and I, I would suggest that this is a good slide to are a good page of notes um, to, to look at and refer to. But again, don't memorize properties, interpret properties in terms of their, um, the model that you're building. And in terms of, you know, again, what the two questions are, what are the particles, what are the relevant particles here, and what are the forces between those particles? Um, so let's look at where, how this might be assessed. This is uh, in there for my biology teaching friends. And most of you might remember this. Um, if you took AP biology or even bio introductory biology. Um, DNA is a double-stranded molecule that stores a genetic code of organisms. It's a double helix. I'm just too young to have been born before this was figured out, but it was not so long ago that there was a, a huge race to, to elucidate the structure of DNA. Um, a good book is called The Double Helix um, by James Watson. Um, any of you who are looking for summer reading, put in a plug there. Um, uh, that just had its 50th anniversary. Well, several years ago, it had its 50th. Anyway, back to chemistry. Um, what are the strongest attractive forces between the strands of DNA? And <clears throat> you're given these choices. Covalent bonds would be incorrect because we're looking for intermolecular forces. Uh, covalent bonds are important between the atoms within a single strand of DNA. Um, but um, but certainly not here. Ion dipole force is also incorrect. Hydrogen bonds, and I hope you all remember this from biology, hydrogen bonds is important. Not only are hydrogen bonds strong enough to keep the DNA double helix together, but they're also weak enough to allow the DNA double helix to separate. And uh, to, again, throw in a plug for my biologist, that's important because it's how cells replicate and, and duplicate all that, that um, in genetic information. The other important thing about hydrogen bonds is that they're very directional. Hydrogen bonds will only um, form between a nitrogen, oxygen, or a fluorine atom um, and a hydrogen atom that is bonded to a, another nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine atom. You don't see too much fluorine in biological molecules, but all the protein structures and DNA are, are count on the fact that these hydrogen bonds are very, very directional. Dispersion forces, while they can become very strong, they're, they're not directional. It doesn't really matter um, how things look or the directions. Uh, this probably should have been in the earlier section, but we've got boron and nitrogen trifluorides and so the name trifluoride might give you a big hint that their formulas are BF3 and NF3. And you have to the molecular shapes of these molecules. And again, here, no one would expect anyone to memorize these shapes. But even in, in 
um, the minute that you might have for a multiple choice question, you should be able to, to, to figure these out. We're looking for molecular geometries. So the first thing you would need to do is write an electron dot diagram. Um, each of these dot diagrams would have a, a central atom, either boron or fluorine, surrounded by three fluor, I'm sorry, either boron or nitrogen, surrounded by three fluorine atoms. Next, you've got to count the total number of valence electrons. In BF3, the boron atom contributes three electrons. Each fluorine atom contributes seven, so that's three plus three times seven would be 24. In NF3, the only difference is that the nitrogen atom would contribute an extra two electrons. It would have five valence electrons. Um, and that would give us 26 total valence electrons to play with. When you set those up, the BF3 will have a central boron atom, three fluorine atoms, and no extra electrons on that central boron. And that will give us a trigonal planar structure, that the four atoms of BF3 would lie in the same plane um, with bond angles of 120 degrees. NF3, on the other hand, would have that extra unshared pair of electrons. And again, encourage you all to, to draw these electron dot diagrams out on your own. Um, but because the nitrogen atom is now surrounded by four electron pair, pairs rather than, rather than three, um, the electrons will be arranged tetrahedrally and the molecular geometry will be trigonal pyramidal. So the correct answer here would be B. This is a favorite schema of questions on the AP exam is to have you compare two different and closely, closely related species. Um, moving on a little bit, because BF3 is very symmetrical, um, because of the fluoride, fluorine atoms are pulling the electrons toward the corners of an equilateral triangle, BF3 would be nonpolar. Nitrogen trifluoride, on the other hand, because the fluorines would be all be pulling in somewhat the same direction, would be a polar molecule. So I'm going to close here. We've been going for almost 50 minutes, and that's plenty. And well, I just want to look at um, um, a free response question. The AP Chem exam this year will be limited to two free response questions with a little bit a longer one and a shorter one. I assume that they will be very general uh, and will give you an opportunity in an open book way to, to show not what you have memorized, because certainly with an open book exam, there's no point to testing factual recall, but whether you can apply these principles to molecules, to substances that, that you may not have seen and I probably will not have seen. So, um, you know, I, I, as you prepare for the exam, please um, spend some time. Don't be, don't be um, thrown off. If it turns out you've never seen this before, think about the principles that you've learned and how to apply them. Um, okay, so we're given acetaldehyde and Again, you don't need to know the names of these. You're told it's a pure liquid. You're asked for the approximate HCH bond angle in acetaldehyde. So this is molecular geometry. Many, many students, and I, I graded this question several years ago when it showed up on the AP exam, and you could guess the most common answer was 90 degrees, because clearly that is a right angle. Sometimes you got 180 degrees. I think students might have been looking for that. Um, remember that these structural diagrams are two-dimensional representations of molecules that are inherently three-dimensional. And just like when you take the, a globe and you squish it into a map, you're going to get distortions. Um, and Greenland is bigger than Iceland or smaller than Iceland, or I keep forgetting, but I know there's some distortion there. This, this structural diagram does not meant to represent the shape of the molecule. Um, what you have to do is look and say that, well, this carbon atom here, the only carbon that has um, more than one carbon hydrogen bond, has got four covalent bonds, and those four bonds will be arranged in the shape of a tetrahedral, and the, the, the bond angle in a tetrahedron is approximately 104.5 degrees, or 109.47 degrees. You do not need to memorize that. Anything between 90 and 120 was, would be taken as a correct answer, but it's emphatically not 90 degrees um, here. Um, in a similar way, the 
bond angle here is roughly 120 degrees because this carbon atom, the one that is double bonded to the oxygen, is only surrounded by three electron pairs and therefore um, would be surrounded by three domains which would arrange themselves along for the corners of an equilateral triangle. Um, this one's going to be hard for me. The structural formula for ethanol, C C2H6O would have two carbon atoms with an OH here and another H on the carbon. So I, I might write as CH3, CH2OH. Um, I think I've actually got that down here. So it wasn't so hard after all. Um, and you know, this this you should be able to come up with a structural formula for that, knowing that carbon atoms will form four bonds, oxygen atoms will form two bonds, and hydrogen atoms will form one bond. And this is one of the two possibilities for C2H6O. The other would be dimethyl ether, and I'll let you think about um, think about how you might rearrange this and still satisfy those bonding rules to form dimethyl ether. Um, and then you might ask about bond strength or bond length. And again, because very simply, the acetaldehyde carbon oxygen bond is a single bond. And the um, ethanol carbon oxygen bond is a, uh, sorry, this is a single bond. The other was a double bond. This one will be weaker and longer. And again, acetal that you're told acetaldehyde is soluble in water, and then ask to sketch an interaction between an acetaldehyde molecule and a water molecule that explains the high solubility of acetaldehyde in water, and identify the strongest intermolecular force, because acetaldehyde has oxygen atoms with a partial negative charge. Um, they will be attracted to the partial positive charge of a water of a hydrogen atom on a water molecule, and I've drawn that in with a dashed line here, and that we would call that a, a hydrogen bond. Um, so again, I hope we, um, those of you who are still here, this has been a, an introduction to a lot of chemistry. This is the um, big ideas one, two, and two, but it's really essentially the structure of matter. Um, ask yourself, what are the forces? What are the particles that are relevant to this? And, and then you answer those questions. Um, I'm going to stop screen sharing now and um, invite you all to um, go download this PDF from these questions from our, our website, KY 2020 or APKY 2020. Um, perhaps Anthony can put that up there on the chat room. Um, and um, also feel free to email me. My email is lacampora at kscc.com. We are eager. We know what challenges that this year is bringing. We also know what opportunities there are and um, and hope that we can support you. Well, we can bring on, have to stay in the hospital. Uh, we want to try to support you as, as you, you know, study and chemistry is hard. I don't think anyone's doing it because it's easy. I, if you are, boy, I'd love to meet you, but uh, it's also gratifying. So thank you very much. And um, I will sign off now.